everybody. Thanks for checking out today's effective note taking workshop. My name is Cynthia, one of the instructors with Iris Reading. Happy to see you in the audience. If you'd like to share where you're joining us from today, Iris Reading is based out of Chicago, is a company born in Chicago. We are broadcasting from Chicago, uh, but curious as to where you're joining us from. So if you'd like to share, feel free to drop that in the chat section. Today we'll be talking about note taking. So if you're maybe having a hard time with your notes, whether that be for class or for a meeting, or maybe you're just not exactly sure how to organize your notes for class, or maybe you don't know what notes to write down for class, any of those things, uh, then this workshop is for you. Okay, if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat as well. Um, if you don't, I hope that you find the presentation helpful. I will share my email at the end of the presentation as well. So if you want to reach out, you're more than welcome to do that. Uh, we are on social media and uh, 2023 is the year we're really trying to make our presence known on all forms of social media. So if um, you do enjoy the presentation, please check us out either on Instagram, on Facebook. We do have a book club on Facebook and it's called Book Lovers Assemble. We talk about all things related to books and literature and maybe some things that annoy us. The, the, one of the recent things we posted was uh, what are some things that annoy you? Um, like have you ever seen anyone do something annoying with a book for example? And there were a few comments that were there I was just like I can't believe it okay so if you want to participate in conversations like that you're more than welcome to check us out on that Facebook group again it's called book lovers assemble and I recognize that uh, my slide isn't updated because I need to add the TikTok handle but it's the same as our iris reading Instagram um, so it's just iris.reading on TikTok Talk as well. So um, obviously you are aware we're on YouTube, you're watching us on YouTube. Um, but if you once again do enjoy the presentation, then we would appreciate if you either liked or subscribed to some of the content we have on there. Now today's presentation, again, we mentioned we'd be talking about note taking and it's really important to remember the reason why we take notes. Uh, Sometimes we, we we don't really think about what the purpose is behind taking notes, right? We see everyone else doing it and we think we probably need to do it too. Um, but that is not the case. We take notes the majority of the time uh, so that they can help us remember, right? And we, we kind of have to put that in perspective sometimes because it feels like Sometimes we just have no idea what's going on and we write everything down. We don't worry about understanding it. And we're just like, I want to memorize everything I wrote on the page so that I can pass the exam. And that's it. Right. And it's like this chaotic cycle that we have where we're overwhelmed and stressed out with what we're writing down. We don't understand it. It looks scary. Right. So we're going to we're going to break down note taking today for you. A few things that we'll cover. First being uh, Different note taking methods. Uh, you might be used to only taking one version of notes or one style, one template for note taking. Uh, we have a few that we found that are very helpful for memory because again, that is, it is a key takeaway for the presentation. You kind of have to remind yourself that when you are taking notes, it is to help you remember it. So if this, whatever we're writing right now is not easy to remember initially, then we might have to tweak it. Okay, so different note-taking methods. We're going to talk about the read and recall exercise. So what happens when we have to take notes or we have to annotate something uh, and the material is just not, like it's not our favorite flavor, right? We all have subjects here and there that we don't necessarily like, um, but what, what happens when we have no choice? We have to take notes there. So read and recall is really good for this. Uh, some digital tools for taking notes as well. So we've found a few applications that we use and we enjoy here at Iris Reading. These have been tested out by multiple members of our team. And we got the green light across the board to share this with our participants on these note taking workshops. So um, we like to find things that are practical, they're functional, um, and uh, we'll be sharing those in a moment. 
and a very, very important point, uh, which is thinking about when you should review these beautifully crafted notes that we will now do after taking today's class, right? It's not just a matter of taking good notes. You also have to think about when you're reviewing your notes, okay? We've had some participants come by and say, oh, I never look at my notes after I take them. I just, that's it. Um, that's not cool, right? That's not, it's not a good thing, especially if our memory, if we're not able to even remember what's on the notes, it's, it's kind of a problem. So we'll talk about that as well. Now, we mentioned note-taking is supposed to help us remember, okay? So when we're thinking about remembering, what are some strategies that we can use to help us remember things either faster or longer? And one of them is just repeating things over and over, right? Um, what, do, what do we say? Repetition is the mother of learning, right? And, and I think the rest of the quote is like the father of something else. But the point is that the more you do something, the higher the chances and the longer this information stays in your memory. But the problem is that you can't just review something or repeat it 10, 20 times and not necessarily think about it. Because if we're not thinking about it and we're just reading it over and over and over again, then that's not actually practical. It's not really going to help. Um, an example of this, if you've ever maybe looked here on YouTube at like um, Star Spangled Banner fails, for example, at sporting events, there are these artists that were born and raised here in the US. And uh, something that happens here in all American elementary schools we sing the like the, the Star Spangled Banner right before every class every day for eight nine years you sing that song and so you would think that you have that song committed to memory fairly well I mean this is eight years of practice right but uh, you notice if you get on YouTube and you find some of these artists that sing at these sporting events that they'll all of a sudden forget the words or they'll kind of like try to sing the overall shape of the word, but they won't say the word because they forgot, right? So mindless repetition, and I believe the official term for this is rote, R-O-T-E repetition, is not going to help you remember. We have to apply a little bit of thinking when we are repeating. So let's keep that in our back pocket for when we are reviewing these beautifully crafted notes that we'll create later. Now we do have an iris method here um, at iris reading and the previous slide was uh, how to read and remember with notes. So we want to introduce our iris method, the I being for inspecting. Okay, so we are iris reading. We have a four step process to better reading and learning and we call it the iris method. Uh, some people call this the study cycle, but we call it the iris method because it goes beautifully with our name. Um, <clears throat> the I is for inspecting. So we talk about this in our speed reading workshop. We want you to inspect anything you need to read before you actually read it. Okay, different to what you may be used to. Maybe in the past you just started reading from beginning to end and then at some point you were like, I didn't need to read this. This isn't what I thought it was going to be. This is boring, I don't have time for this. Whatever the case may be, inspecting can help save you time and it can help you pay attention, okay? So first we inspect, then we decide if we are going to read something or not, okay? You maybe receive an email from a professor saying he recommends these articles over the weekend to be read and then you inspect them and you realize they have nothing to do with your classwork, your major, your coursework, nothing like that. So you skip it. Or, or you decide to read it. But the point is you have a better idea after inspecting. Okay, So then you decide if you will read or you will not read. Followed by our third step, which is inquire and asking all of the right questions. And uh, we've actually created a workshop recently, fairly recently, and we launched it in March on what questions you should be asking when learning something. Um, there are certain subjects that we may feel are we're completely foreign to them. And so when we hear them, we have no idea where to even start dissecting the subject so that we can understand it. 
this uh, workshop, we've called it our comprehensions workshop. We're playing around with the title, but it's really about asking the right questions. And we actually hit on six questions that you can apply uh, over multiple subjects uh, to help deepen your understanding. Now, this is a very important step because when you're asking these questions, ideally, you are also able to answer them. And if you are not able to answer them, then we don't want you to move to the final step, which is some kind of storing method, whether you're storing it in your memory or you're writing it down on paper. Okay, We don't want you to write it down if you don't understand it. And we don't want you to memorize it if you don't understand it. Because if you don't understand it now, are you going to understand it later? Are you going to have access to a professor to explain it to you later? Not exactly, right? So this is our four-step process. Again, write it down. It is the IRIS method. Now let's talk about some note-taking strategies to enhance our recall, okay? Which is just a fancy way of saying note-taking strategies to help us remember, all right? So let's start out with this picture. What do you think about this? This is this is this is scary, right? All this pink on the page and looks like whoever was reading this was like this sentence is important and this one and this one and this one and then they completely changed the color of the page. Now it is possible that a lot of this information is important, but is it possible? I mean, is it realistic to think that every single sentence on the page is important? No, right? So let's talk about some best practices with underlining and highlighting first. Now, we don't want you to read and highlight at the same time. We have found a lot of research on this subject and two reasons primarily why you should not read and highlight. Number one being it's actually considered to be a form of passive learning, which means essentially you're not really paying attention. Okay, maybe you, um, you know, with a highlighting, it feels like you might be, but neuroscientists have found that your average person is actually not paying attention when they're reading and highlighting at the same time. Okay, so we don't, we don't want to confuse passive learning with active learning or active reading. Okay, so passively reading is never a good thing. Second reason, when you're reading and highlighting at the same time, you're actually running the risk of highlighting things that are probably not important. And how do you know if they're important? Well, you don't. You don't know until you have finished reading the paragraph. Okay, so if you absolutely must crack open those beautiful pink, yellow, green highlighters, that's fine. I like highlighters too. But we'd ask that you first read through a paragraph before you then decide if you're going to read it, uh, highlight anything or not, okay? Um, if at most, maybe two or three sentences per paragraph, the main ideas, if you will, but please don't read and highlight at the same time. We don't want to confuse passive learning with active learning, all right? So those are the best practices when we're talking about highlighting, but what about taking concise notes? Now, remember this uh, IRIS method I shared with you all earlier? Um, I said we, we need to inspect before we read, then we decide if we're going to read, then we ask questions. So when we're taking notes, how then will we know what we should write down? How do you know when you get to class? You don't, right? There's, I mean, unless you have access to the syllabus or you have access to the outline of the day or you knew beforehand what would be discussed, most classes will provide some kind of information the day before, right? And that is your ticket to preparing to, again, make sure you're writing everything you need to write down and more importantly, you're understanding it when in class. See, most of us will probably wait to take our notes and to prepare until the day of. And then the day of, we write all these things down, we don't understand them, or maybe we somewhat understand them. We go home, we memorize something that we kind of sort of understand, we take the test and then we get like a 70%, right? So we, we don't want to do that. 
we want to prepare beforehand. Whether you have a chapter that you have access to, maybe you can inspect it beforehand and see some of those vocabulary words that will be discussed in the lecture. If you're seeing that the vocabulary words are really big, maybe you can come up with some acronym so that when you're writing down explanations, you'll understand not only the explanation, but you don't have to spend you know, a whole three seconds writing out a word when you just have a simple acronym on the page. Okay, and this leaves room for asking questions, which is the most important thing in lecture. It's one of the only times when you have a professor on standby to help answer your questions. So we don't want you to save the asking of questions for a later time. We want you to ask them during that class time, write down the answers to these questions and then go home and have everything you need right to study and pass the exam so taking concise notes this way now we might be used to the other way where we're kind of just playing catch up always it's never ending catch up right not catch up but catching up right and we don't want to do that because again we have a system we have a four step plan or a four step system that is going to help us read and learn better Okay, so these are some brief suggestions to take better notes or concise notes. And again, here's our iris method. Okay, uh, but we've had a few people ask us recently, and actually not recently, over the years they've asked, um, what is better, writing your notes out or taking digital typed out notes? What, what's best? And we won't tell you what's best, but we will tell you what science has shown us. So again, we found a lot of research on the subject. And remember what we discussed in the beginning about repetition and how that helps with your memory? When you're writing your notes out, this is a really good way for your brain to repeat what is being written down. Uh, not so much when you're typing your notes out. Actually, you hardly have to think when you're typing your notes out. It's fairly easy to keep up with whoever's talking when you're typing your notes out. But when you're writing them, you have to think, what is she saying? And then you remember it, and then you write it down. So you do have a rep or two in there trying to write whatever you need to write down. So uh, keep that in mind. If you're maybe typing your notes out and you're having a hard time remembering, this might be why. Now, when we take our notes, um, if you have something that looks like this, Remember that the purpose again, and I want to stress the purpose, is um, that we want you to remember what, what, what you're writing down. This is supposed to help your memory. So look at this page on the screen, maybe read through some of it, and then try to just quickly recall something off the page, right? Uh, most of us will probably not be able to do this because most of us are probably not linear thinkers. So another very important thing to keep in mind with taking notes is that you want to take notes in a way that match up with how you think. Now, when I say we're not linear thinkers, I'm saying that most of us probably don't think in full sentences, right? Um, I'm not saying that some don't, but I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not saying that some do, Wait, I, I got a tongue twister. Some of us do not think in full sentences, but some do, right? And for those of you that do, no problem here. But I'm talking to the majority who are probably at 80% that do not think in this way, right? So if you're writing full sentences in your notes and you're trying to remember that, that's not that's not going to match up. It's not going to line up, right? Um, so we, we want to find some note-taking methods that match up with how we think right? Um, so this type of note-taking method, these sentences like this, um, it may work for some, but it probably won't work for a lot, all right? So remember that again, if there's anything you take away from today's class, we want it to be that you must be able to remember what you write down. So let's say you're like, well, Cynthia, I am a linear thinker. I think in full sentences, my problem is more so along the lines of just organizing my notes because when I write my notes out, I have to color code them. I have to put a star and, and an arrow pointing from one sentence to the other, and I, it looks like a map at the end of it. That's fine. 
okay? But using an outline is probably a better way of taking your notes. So if you absolutely must write in full sentences, that is fine. And I know this sounds pretty weird, um, but but think about it. Just catch yourself thinking one day and, and see, are you, are you thinking in full sentences or, or not, right? So the outline method is really good if you are a linear thinker, but you just have a hard time organizing your notes, okay? So we don't have to worry about and actually, I used to have a student when I teach in these uh, nursing classes in the city, and she would stay after class for about an hour and a half every time we had class. And I thought maybe she just needed the space to study, which, you know, wasn't a problem. But one day I just kind of walked over. I was like, hey, you know, what's up? And she'd say, oh, no, I, you know, I listen to the lecture and then I then I turn around and I color code my notes and I reorganize everything. And I make sure that my notes look uh, presentable um, and they're understandable, more importantly. And, and I was like, we just have to find a better way to, to take our notes. I don't think we, we need to spend an hour after each class to, uh, to do this. So uh, we just, you know, we introduced outlines to her and she, uh, she was taking better notes, smarter notes. Okay. Um, but maybe... Maybe the outline method isn't something we're, we're interested in doing. Well, think about how we think. Um, when I say, for example, the words mango or chihuahua, you might have heard my dog growling a second ago. Um, you know, I think of banana or I think of McDonald's. What do you see in your brain? Do you see, uh, do you see the objects or do you see the words? Most of us see uh, the pictures, right? And um, that's why sketch notes are a great way to take your notes. Um, here we have a sketch note on ancient Egypt. So we've got Ra, who is the sun god. You see it right here. Horus, who was the god of the sky. Anubis, who was the god of mummification. We have, for example, fish, the Nile River, right? Rosetta Stone, papyrus. Now. Keep in mind, you don't have to be an artist to take these kinds of notes. I obviously am not seeing that these are all stick figures, but they get the message across, right? So this is a good way to take notes as well. Uh, don't be embarrassed with taking this type of note either. I mean, again, this helps you remember. So if it works for you, no shame in that. My favorite type of uh, note-taking method um, are using mind maps. And here's why. When, let's say hypothetically, I was to try to explain something to you that you've never heard before, and I'm and I'm explaining this to you, and you're like, this sounds so foreign, I can't believe this is like a real thing. Maybe in the moment you don't understand it, but later on when you're thinking about this, you have like, a, you, you know, you've got a thought process, and, and, and that's what usually happens, right? We, we sometimes have to reason through things to actually understand them. So mind mapping mimics the way we think. Right, we kind of have to get through one level to get through another level to get through the ex next level to get to that central topic. Okay, so um, mind mapping is almost like a two for one type of thing. So you're reading uh, or learning, I'm sorry, and you're taking notes at the same time. And this is different to other methods, right? So you're working through understanding this subject. Um, we're big fans of this. You can always do a mind map on pen and paper, just the standard if you want to do, but um, we like using xmind.net. It's a great app to use. Uh, you do have to download it. That's the only, you know, um, thing with uh, xmind, but it is free. They do have a paid version, but we've gotten away with using the free version for for years, never had a problem with it, um, so that's good. But if you don't want to download anything, though, MindMeister.com is a great alternative. Um, this is online. It's a little more modern with the colors and everything. And one of my favorite features with MindMeister is uh, the fact that you're able to um, go through other people's mind maps. So if you're maybe on a subject and you search this keyword in their search bar, you can pop up a bunch of mind maps that have those same keywords in other people's mind maps. So this is a great way to take notes as well. Cornell Notes is a great uh, template as well. Um, 
And, and I have made a little tweak to Cornell Notes. So we've got keywords and questions on the side, main notes in the middle, a summary at the bottom. But I have included a, when I take these types of notes using this template, I'll include another line right here for examples, only because just I know how I think. And even though I have everything written out nicely, it's nice to have an example that kind of proves everything that you've written down. So um, I'll usually include that in my Cornell note. Um, monetary notes is another great way to take notes and it's using spreadsheets. Now, you don't have to necessarily be a spreadsheet wizard to use this method. A fairly simple understanding of uh, spreadsheets is, is enough. Uh, you've got here your, your title at the top left corner. Then you'll notice we have four columns. So we've got the chapter, the page number, the rating, and the note itself. Okay, so you'll notice we have hundreds is an example of a note that is most important. 50 is an example of a note that is important. And 20 is an example of a note that is important, but least important. So throughout the semester, you were typing out your notes in here, you're rating them, you're giving them a page number and a chapter number. And then what happens when it's time for final exams? when most people are probably freaking out because they have no idea what to write down. Not you, because you have everything categorized in your notes. And a nice feature on these spreadsheets is that you can organize them from high to low or from ascending to descending, meaning you can put all your hundreds at the top, your 50s in the middle, and your 20s at the bottom. Uh, Evernote is a great tool to use as well. Um, I enjoyed this one specifically because of the synchronizing feature that they have. So if you're typing your notes on your laptop and then um, you have the app on your phone, uh, when commuting, you don't have to worry um, about, like, for example, I, I live in the city of Chicago and my commute back home would be about an hour and a half every day going and coming. And so that was a lot of time I didn't want to I didn't want to necessarily lose while I was sitting on the bus or on the train. And uh, it's not a very smart idea to pull out a laptop right on the train or on the bus. Really, I don't think in any city in the world. So because I had the application on my cell phone, um, everything was automatically syncing. And so while commuting, instead of playing Candy Crush or getting on TikTok, I had access to my notes so I could review them while commuting and not have to pull out my laptop. Um, so this is our IRIS method. Again, don't forget inspecting, reading, inquiring, and storing. Now, what happens when we have a hard time concentrating? Uh, maybe we have a subject that we don't necessarily like, right? What, what do we do there? Uh, well, we have the read and recall exercise. So read and recall is great because it's almost like an accountability partner in the sense that um, if you can't pay attention and you don't have anybody to kind of cheer you on, uh, read and recall will do it for you. So you read and then you take a note matching up how much you read. So let's say, for example, you read two paragraphs, then your summary will probably be about two or three sentences. Again, this is proving to you that you actually did read and pay attention and understand, okay? So you know that you're gonna have to do this at the end of each section, or at the end of each paragraph, however you choose. And so you are paying a little more attention. And that's how we get through maybe a module in a textbook or something like that. So we're actually gonna try this out with Bill Bryson's A Really Short History of Nearly Everything. Remember we did share that uh, we do have a, um, a book club on Facebook and this is one of the recommendations that we have made in the past. It's a tremendous read, so I, I highly recommend it. Um, and I just learned that Bill Bryson wrote a traveling book. I was while, while on that Facebook group, so um, I had to check that out as soon as a uh, participant commented. But we're going to use this method. We're gonna test it out using uh, Bill Bryson's book. Now, we have included a few passages from the book on here. What will happen is we'll read for about a minute, minute and a half, and then I'll ask you to write something down at the end of each paragraph. Um, you don't have to send it to me. You can either text it to yourself, write it on a scrap piece of paper. We're going to test this out four different times, okay? 
Um, and also remember, if you ever use this method on your own, like when you're having a hard time paying attention, you don't have to time yourself. It's just I'm timing us because I have to keep it under an hour. So you don't you don't have to time yourself, um, but I have to keep the presentation. I only have 30 minutes left, so I don't want to go over time. So for these drills, I will disable my webcam. This is the intro. So remember, you're matching up your note with how much you read. So Notice this first paragraph is only about two or three sentences, so your note might only be two or three phrases at that. All right, everyone, here we go. We're starting with the intro. Three, two, one, go. All right, very good. This was the intro. We're going to do this three more times. Now with chapter one, how to build a universe. Okay, so notice the first paragraph is a little shorter, um, which means your note will be a little smaller. All right, so here we go. Uh, one minute of reading and, and we're going to write something down at the end of each paragraph. Ready? Three, two, one, go. All right, very good. That was chapter one. Let's go to chapter two. Now, look at this. This first paragraph is so much larger. So that means your note is probably going to be a little longer as well. Okay, so here we go. Chapter two. Welcome to the solar system. Resetting my timer. Three, two, one, go. All right, very good. Now chapter three. This is the last time. Actually, we have one more, but I won't make you do the last one. Seeing it's a lot of reading for this morning. All right, we're gonna do chapter three, and that's it. Ready? Here we go. Three, two, one, go.
All right, very good. So that was read and recall. Let me know what your thoughts are on that. You can leave it in the chat. You can send me an email. You can tell me on social media what your thoughts are on that. Um, by the way, uh, we do manage, I do manage the Instagram account um, and it is linked up to my phone. So if you do send us a message, we can see that automatically. So again, if you wanna say, hey, Cynthia, guess what? I hate the read and recall method, that's fine. I'm just curious. Again, we like to see what our participants enjoy and what they don't, right? So just feel free to share honest feedback. No, no, uh, no problem. Don't worry. All right. So last point we're going to talk about for today is the science behind why we forget things, because unfortunately we do forget things. It just happens, right? If I were to ask you how fast do you forget, you might say, "Ha!" Immediately, I forget things immediately, but. We have found, again, research um, on this subject, and it turns out that your average person does not have a bad memory. What they do, however, had is something called hyperstimulation. So your brain actually gets used to seeing so many things at the same time, um, specifically with electronic devices and social media. So your brain is so hyperstimulated with texting and TikTok and Angry Birds and everything like that so that when your brain actually tries to pay attention uh, to something, it maybe feels like it is, but it's not, okay? And so um, then you maybe quiz this person on what they think they were learning and it turns out they can't remember and they attribute that to having bad memory. When that's not usually the case, I mean, unless you have a condition that impairs your memory, then that's a different story, but most people don't. So um, yeah, so um, keep, keep that in mind. Now, there is such a thing as the forgetting curve, and I don't wanna um, butcher the German psychologist that actually came up with this. It's, it's a, um, a very uh, tricky name to pronounce, so I, I'm not going to, uh, to say it, but, um, he created or he, he discovered this forgetting curve and how you notice uh, at the top right here, um, as soon as you learn something, you start to forget it almost immediately, okay? Um, and so that, that's kind of scary for us as students, right? Because if you start to forget it almost immediately, then the question is when, when should we then review our notes, right? And we have actually uncovered a mathematical approach to memory, um, again, trying to bypass this uh, forgetting curve, and it's using the Fibonacci sequence. Okay, so um, don't worry about writing this long string of numbers out. All you need to remember is here. So we've got one plus one is two, uh, one plus two is three, two plus three is five, three plus five is eight. So you notice the last two numbers equal the third number. Okay, and that is Fibonacci. So how do we then apply this to our review periods when we're reviewing something? Um, We've got, let's say you learn something today at noon. Um, if you're using Fibonacci, you review it one hour later, two hours later, three, five, eight, and then 13 hours later, okay? Um, and it's very important for you to have this gap in the middle right here. So you'll notice there's a, like, it's a break. And, and that's important because although uh, your brain is not a muscle, we should treat it like one. So if you think about an athlete that's about to compete in maybe the Ironman or the Olympics or the World Cup, you, you never see them working out like 10, 12, no, maybe 10 hours, yeah, but you don't see them working out 16, 20 hours a day, right? That's a lot, the body needs rest. And, and the same thing with the mind. So we can work it out like a muscle, but we should also give it a break when it deserves it, okay? So you can use this Fibonacci sequence on an hourly basis on a daily basis, on a monthly basis. If these are too far apart, you could also do it on a minute by minute basis as well. So one minute, one minute, two, three, five, eight, 13 minutes after when you learn something. Okay, so um, it's a nice way to space things out. Now that is called space repetition. And uh, if you combine that with something called retrieval practice, then you're a rock star <laughs> when we're talking about memory. Okay, now retrieval practice is taking information from your brain and then just putting it back. So this actually tells us that it's also important to review things that you already know. Most of us are maybe fixated on reviewing things that we don't, but we have to also add into this 
the facts that we do know, okay? Because what happens if you have something in your brain and you don't touch it for years? Then what happens? Will you remember it? You might recognize the overall shape of whatever that was, but you're not going to be, you're not going to remember it as, as you maybe thought you did. Um, if you maybe grew up speaking a language and then you stop speaking that language for a long time, it starts to disappear, right? And then your family's like, what's your problem? You act like you've never speak, you know, spoken Spanish before. And you're like, eh, sorry, I stopped speaking it for a long time. It just happens, right? So um, when you combine, again, the space repetition with the retrieval practice, um, you're going to be a, a memory rock star, a memory genius. Uh, and we really enjoy Quizlet because flashcards are a good way to kind of do this retrieval practice where you're pulling information from your brain and putting it back. Uh, that's the overall idea with flashcards. Now, when I was in school, we didn't have a fancy schmancy Quizlet that is so modern and new and you can do it on your phone, right? When I was in school, we had to do the flashcards, right? With the rubber band and then that rubber band would snap in your book bag and all your flashcards would be floating everywhere. But with Quizlet, that's not the case. You don't have to go through that anymore, right? It's a great free application to use. There are many, many subjects on there. It's modern, it's animated, it's bright, it's colorful, right? Um, many subjects, as we said. But the one reason we actually appreciate Quizlet the most is because of this term. And again, uh, researchers have uh, created or defined as uh, something called gamification or gamifying your learning and if you notice there's a corner here that says game-based learning so there's science behind this and the science is that when you gamify your learning experience students are actually seen to do better and remember for longer than those students who just approach their notes in a monotonous fashion just annoyed not happy um, you're not seen to do that great. So when you turn your notes into a game, when you maybe create a game with classmates um, on a specific subject that you're learning, you're seen to do better and have a higher chance of remembering. So obviously Quizlet has many wonderful, many wonderful features, but we appreciate the gamifying side of it or the gamification because games, who doesn't like a game, right? So Quizlet has two games on there or three. Uh, but you could always create your own as well. Now with that, we are wrapping up today's presentation. So thank you for coming. Again, please don't forget to check us out on social media. We do have a discount code for those in the, of you in the audience that stuck around. Um, if you'd like to take any of our other courses on our website, whether that be speed reading, memory, right? You can use this code on the screen, book lovers for 30% off. Um, feel free to send me an email if you have any questions, if you would like maybe a copy of the slides, um, I can send that to you. We also have a uh, tip sheet. Um, and with that, I hope to see you all in a future workshop. Thanks for stopping by, everyone. Have a good one. Bye-bye.